Hello AP Statistics and welcome to Comparing Two Means for Chapter 23. Hmm, frozen pizza? Yeah, I don't eat frozen pizza. Um, we have four things that we want to hit real quick. Our formulas and condition, confidence intervals, test of hypothesis, and then at the very end we need to talk a little bit about pooling. Our formulas, don't get too hung up on the formulas. We're just going to blow through this real quick. Our standard error is for the difference of two means. So, of course, you're going to add the square of the variance, and that's what it comes out with. And then our t value would be the this minus the true mean divided by the standard error. Looks ugly, but in fact, your calculator will just do all of it for you. So, this section is not really about calculating. So, our confidence intervals would be... Our difference, plus or minus the critical value times the standard error. It just looks bad. Degrees of freedom is kind of a funny thing when you have two samples um, because you take one less than the sample size. We have two sample sizes. Well, if you're doing this by hand, there is the conservative method, which is where you would take the smaller of the two degrees of freedom. Most of us are not going to do this by hand. So we will do the other choice, which is to use this wonderful formula. Boy, you thought the other stuff looked complicated. Thing is, you don't actually do that. Your calculator will do that. And this is how it is calculating the standard D, excuse me, the degrees of freedom. So our conditions, the first one is probably the most important one, is that the two groups, you are doing two means. That means that it is a mean from two different groups that are completely independent of each other. And that is one that you need to remember to check. The other one, as always, within each group, the sampling is independent, and there's randomization for both data groups. And then the last one down there, can't see it, but it says the 10% condition, where we are, because we're usually sampling without replacement, that is kind of required to obtain the independence. Most of the time with means, 10% is just not an issue at all. In fact, it's usually just ignored because the populations are so big and your sample size is so small. The other thing is the normality, um, and this is going to be the same that we did for one sample, except you have to check it for both values. So you have the small, the medium, and then the large sample size. Small really can't have any skew or outliers. The medium can have a little bit, and then the large, it isn't as important. And really large, it, you don't really have to check it at all. So our confidence intervals, first off, they are always about the difference between our two means. We are not doing two different intervals and then subtracting the intervals. We're actually doing the, the difference of those two means is what is right in the center of our interval. Um, our focus is on understanding and interpretation, not on calculating. That's why I don't really want you to pay too much attention to those formulas. Uh, we will do a two sample because we have two independent samples, T interval because we're doing means. So we do the T distribution. I know your calculator has a two sample Z interval but we will not use the z-interval. In fact, nobody really uses it because that would assume that you knew what the standard deviation was even when you didn't know what the mean was, and that never happens in real life. So we have a quick example here, resting pulse rates from 26 smokers had a mean of 80 beats per minute and a standard deviation of five beats per minute among 32 randomly chosen non-smokers. The mean and standard deviation are 74 and six. Both sets of data were roughly symmetric and had no outliers. So they are telling you that the conditions are met. It was random. They're nice and symmetric, no outliers. So we can assume the conditions are met. So let's go through. We got a whole list of questions here. First one starts off with just finding the interval and then a few interpretation questions. So I do, when I do these problems, I like to write down sort of the key values that I know I'm going to need. So like the sample size, the mean, and the standard 
error, the standard, the sample standard deviation, and then the sample size, the mean, and the sample standard deviation. It's arbitrary as to which one you call first. I would probably do the smokers first because our calculator does the first one minus the second one. And that gives you a positive value. On your assignment, they tell you which one to do first. So we're going to do a 95% confidence interval, stat, and then arrow over to tests. And you will notice, again, the tests of significance are first, and all of the intervals are at the bottom. And we just got to go down one more line to get to number 10, where we have our two sample T interval. You should know what you're looking for before you get pick up your calculator. That will save you a lot of trouble. Um, we are not going to pool. And that is what I will talk about at the very end of all of this as to why it is we are not going to pool. I do not have the data. We had the stats. And then I've entered all of the stats, the mean, the standard deviation, the sample size, the mean, the standard deviation, the sample size, doing a 95% interval. And it will calculate very quickly. I'm just in the way all the time. Uh, we get our quick interval. We also get our degrees of freedom. Isn't that just a nice little number? It used that nasty formula to come up with that. It also repeats and gives you back all the information that you put in. So let's go on to answer those questions about our interval, which is right here, by the way. What is the margin of error? Well, the margin of error is half of that interval. So you, there's a couple ways you can do this. I personally like to just find the total distance between the two and then divide by two. There's other ways you can come up with that number though. Okay, next question was, is there significant difference that the resting pulse rates of smokers is different from the rates of non-smokers? Why? Well, we didn't do a significance test. We did a confidence interval. But if we had done a significance test and we were saying that the pulse rates were the same, that means their difference would be zero and zero is not in our interval. So that means that we are far enough away from zero that it would be significant. And I did type that out here in the PowerPoint, probably didn't use the same words, but it's the same basic idea. One thing to notice here, if we did a two-tailed test, confidence intervals are always two-tailed. So if we did a two-tailed, two-sample t-test, our p-value would come up less than 5%, because 5% is the complement of our 95%. So that's kind of this question is connecting those two concepts together. Okay, last one is, if we found a 90% interval, would it be wider or narrower? I think this is just an obvious question, but I still get people that miss it. There's 95% interval, there's a 90% interval. Well, 90 is not as wide, it, it is not as much of the graph as 90%. So it would be narrower. It doesn't matter what kind of an interval you're doing. A 90% interval is always narrower than a 95. Okay, let's get into a second example and we'll do a test of hypothesis on this one. On this example, we have the data instead of the statistics. Two national brands of frozen pizza are tested for grams of saturated fat per serving. Is there a statistically significant difference between the two brands? We have the data. So first thing, we'll, we'll go ahead and write our hypothesis. Typically, you would have the hypothesis before you collect the data. So just looking at this data, it looks like the brand RV does have a smaller average than brand D, but you wouldn't know that until you collected the data. So we are saying that, is there a difference? So it is gonna be a two-tailed test. So there's our null, where they're the same, and our alternative, where they are just different, so two-tailed. Of course, first thing is, you have to punch all that data in your calculator, and then they didn't tell us, we have to assume they were collected randomly, 
but they didn't tell us anything about symmetry or outliers. So we need to do that ourselves. So both of these are kind of in the middle population or sample size. And there, you know, the second one, what is that RB is skewed, but it's not hugely skewed. It's a little bit skewed. And this one's maybe not as much. I mean, there's one value there that is kind of stopping that from being really symmetrical. So you can't get too picky about looking at these things. And the same thing here, you've got two values over here that if they were on this side, you would say that was really nice and symmetrical. So they're not too far. I, I don't think that's too bad at all. I will say when you are doing the homework, if you come up with a graph that is heavily skewed or has outliers, then and you know that the conditions are met, that doesn't mean you get to stop doing the problem. You still have to keep going. Okay, so went up to stat and then arrowed over to test. Remember all the tests come first and there it is, two sample t test. Not Z. And this time we have the data. Um, put the D in list one and the RB in list two, so that's my first and second. We did a two tail. Again, we are not going to pool the data. And then we'll calculate. I actually did both calculate and draw just to show you what it looks like. Calculate comes up with all of our nice stuff. Our T value, that's almost, almost five. You can consider that to be five standard deviations. It's actually five standard errors above the mean or above zero in this case. That's quite a ways up there, which is why our p-value is so small. And then again, it does give us that um, degrees of freedom. There's an arrow here because if you arrow down, you'll see the two sample sizes. If you do the drawing, um, it is slow, but it just gives you the p equals zero because it only gives you what, four decimal points? And the first four decimal points are zero. But it does give you the t-value. Just to get an idea, see we go one, two, three, four, almost to five, that's where our sample is, way over there. And we are saying the shaded part is the likelihood that our sample comes from this graph. And you can't even see the shaded part because it's so small, which means it's a pretty strong argument that we did not come from this graph. So we have strong evidence to reject the null. So our test statistic, our p-value, and then our conclusion. This is very strong evidence that there is a difference between the amount of saturated fats between the two brands. Well, that's it. So I did one confidence interval and one test of hypothesis. Um, I did one where you're given the stats and one where you use the data. Um, we do need to talk about pooling real quick. So when we did our two proportion test of hypothesis, you or your calculator pool to find the standard error. And the reason you did that is because, I believe it says that right here, the reason you did that is because with proportions, you use the proportion to calculate the standard error. So when you're doing a two proportion test of hypothesis, you are starting by saying, the proportions are equal, and therefore, it would follow that the standard errors are equal. That is not true with means. The means, it is very common to have random variables that have the same mean, but a different standard error or standard deviation. And in fact, to make the assumption that they have the same standard error is a pretty big assumption. And you really have to have some evidence to back that up. And we usually have no idea. So as the textbook says, and I'm going to say, play it safe. Don't jump in the pool. Thank you very much. We'll see you on Chapter 24.